Great, thanks, Olivia. Um, and thanks everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm gonna be talking tonight about preserving hip mobility. As she mentioned, I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here at the center. I specialize primarily in hip and knee replacement, um, but I see a lot of patients with different hip problems um, and sometimes problems that they think are related to the hip that are related to other parts of the body. And so I'm gonna sort of hit on, on a bunch of that tonight um, and talk about how you can preserve your hip mobility and enjoy all that Central Oregon has to offer. So first I'm gonna talk about some common causes of hip pain. I'm gonna talk about some non-surgical options. I think it's always important to have surgery as a last resort with any, anything that's going on. Um, talk a little bit about hip preservation surgery, um, which is a little bit separate from hip replacement and sometimes proceeds by, in some cases, several decades, uh, hip replacement. Then I'm gonna talk a little about hip replacement and our outpatient joint replacement program here at the center. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna leave hopefully ample time for any questions um, that anybody has after uh, what we talk about tonight. So hip pain um, does not always actually come from the hip itself. Um, so the problems with the ball and socket are one source of the hip pain or, or what people come in complaining about. The muscles around the hip can also cause symptoms that cause people to present to our office. And then it can also be referred in many cases from nerve compression. Um, and pain from the spine. Uh, it sort of depends on exactly where the location of the pain is as to how we as clinicians help sort of figure out what is going on and, and how to treat it. And I'll sort of hit on some of those things tonight so that if any of you, if any of you are having some of these symptoms, it may answer some of those questions as to whether it is truly your hip or whether it may be something else. So first I'm gonna go over a little bit of some basic anatomy of the hip joint. So the hip itself is a pretty eloquent ball and socket joint. So there's a couple of sort of cartoons up here. Starting up here on the left, this shows the bony anatomy of the pelvis. And so this is, if you're, imagine you're sort of looking at this person. So this would be their right hip and their left hip. And so it sort of shows the cartilage surface of the ball um, of the hip joint, which is we call the femoral head. And then this is a cross section of that where you can see the femoral head, which is the ball of the hip joint. And then you can also see the socket. Within the hip joint, there's normal synovial fluid that helps provide sort of some lubrication to allow the hip to move freely. And there's a couple millimeters of cartilage on both the socket side and also the ball side. There's also a, a pretty important structure in the hip called the labrum, which this notates right here, but this is sort of a more zoomed in picture showing the labrum. The labrum is, is kind of like a shock absorber um, but also a gasket in the hip joint that's important for stability and also allowing you to, to have normal hip function. And so I'll, I'll touch a little bit about how that can sometimes present as hip pain. There are a lot of muscles around the hip. Um, the gluteus maximus uh, and medius are several um, important muscles that uh, help provide hip mobility. And um, then there are also some deeper down muscles um, below the buttock and, and gluteus muscle here, the piriformis and some of the external rotators um, that also provide some important mobility. Not shown here is the sciatic nerve, which actually comes out right here between these muscles in the back of the hip. Um, and sometimes you may have heard of something called piriformis syndrome, and that's basically where this piriformis muscle is actually irritating the sciatic nerve as it comes down the back of the leg there. Also, I think it's worth noting anytime we're talking about hip pain, um, some sort of spine anatomy, because the two often overlap. Patients often have both hip and spine problems um, and sometimes go see a spine surgeon when they really have a hip problem and vice versa. So this is what the nerve roots look like when they come out of the spinal cord. So at every single vertebral level or every single bony level in the spine, there is a nerve root that comes out. And then those are numbered corresponding to the vertebrae that they come out at. So starting at the cervical spine, um, up through C6, C7, C8, down through the hand, and then in the thoracic spine that covers most of the chest, and then the lumbar and sacral spine. And so this is what we call it's a dermatomal map. And so these are the maps of the normal distribution for each of those nerve root levels. And so sometimes people will come in with pain that radiates from the low back down the leg in one of these specific distributions. And that then is more likely coming from nerve compression from the lumbar spine or sometimes thoracic or cervical spine. Um, and so sometimes, you know, they'll sort of paint with a paintbrush in, in a region that 
matches one of these dermatomes. And that sort of keys us off as clinicians that this may not be coming from the hip, ball, and socket joint itself, but potentially from some nerve compression in the, in the spine. Hip pain is actually a very common problem. Um, as I was sort of looking up and preparing for this talk, um, there's a bunch of studies that have shown that about 30 to 40% of adults who are active or play sports do experience some element of chronic hip pain. A lot of people here in Central Oregon play pickleball, hike, ski. Um, and, and so I think that there are a lot of people <laughs> that, that I see who have hip pain. And I think a lot of you um, are experiencing some of that as well. As you look at older patients, it's also very common in patients over 60. Um, I think I'd say probably more than half of the patients I see in my clinic are coming in for hip related problems rather than knee problems. Um, but it's a very common thing that we see and, and something that we can often address sometimes non-surgically and sometimes surgically to get people back to doing the things that they really enjoy. So the most important thing when we are trying to diagnose the cause of what is causing the hip pain, I really think is, is history and physical exam. And this goes back to sort of the basics of training in medical school and residency, but really asking patients, where is the pain? What makes the pain better? What are some alleviating and aggravating um, things that you can do, whether it's worse going up and down stairs, worse in a standing or seated position? All of those things sort of help key us into what may be the primary source of the pain that you're experiencing. X-rays are, in some cases, sort of considered part of our physical exam, and I think they're important to help us rule out and rule in different sources of pathology that may be contributing to what's causing your hip pain. Sometimes exam and x-rays are insufficient, or we need a little bit more information, and in those cases, MRIs or CT scans can sometimes be quite helpful. A lot of times, we can actually gain most of the information that we need just from physical exam and from x-rays, um, and so it's not something that I often do, but sometimes if the exam doesn't quite add up or there are certain questions or concerns about what may actually be causing the pain, then we'll get an MRI or a CT scan, which is a more advanced imaging study that provides more granular detail about the part of the body that we're trying to look at. Diagnostic or therapeutic injections can also be incredibly helpful, especially in patients where we're trying to delineate hip problems um, or spine problems, because as I said, they can often be overlapping. And so sometimes getting an injection in one of those areas, either an area where we think the nerve is compressed or in the hip joint itself or in some of the muscles around the hip can provide both therapeutic relief for the patient, but also help us diagnostically to sort of confirm that this is the source of the, the pain or the pathology. So I hit briefly on, on nerve compression. I'm gonna go a little bit more in, in depth on that here. So um, it often originates in the buttock or the lateral or outside part of the hip. So people will come in and see me and they'll point to sort of the outside part of the hip. And when I see that, the first thing I think is it's probably either related to some muscles around the hip, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well, or it may be coming from the back. This nerve compression type pain is often described as an electrical type pain. And as I mentioned before, it often radiates or sort of moves down the, the leg or arm in a distribution that matches that nerve. Um, and again, this is that dermatomal distribution showing the typical distribution of the dermatomes or the areas that are innervated by specific nerves. L4 and L5 are the most common levels for nerve degeneration and compression in the low spine. And so this distribution that comes around the outside of the hip over top of the knee or just to the side of the knee are, are some of the most common areas where we see that nerve compression manifest. It can often be associated with numbness or tingling, which, which can sometimes be positional. Um, and it often, one of the things that classically is taught is it radiates or moves past the level of the knee. You can sometimes have pain from the knee that radiates down to the level of the knee, but it often stops at the knee if it's originating from the hip. But if it's more nerve compression, then it really moves along the full distribution of that nerve down past the level of the knee. So I've been talking a little bit about like specific nerve root compression. One of the other things that can sometimes cause pain that, that is a little bit more vague sometimes is spinal stenosis. And this is narrowing of the area around the, the entire sort of spinal cord in the low spine. And that tends to present more with sort of a gluteal or, or buttock heaviness type pain that as you continue to walk in an upright position tends to make its way and migrate further down the leg and buttock. This often also presents with something that we classically call the shopping cart sign, 
And that means that when you actually lean forward, it creates more space around those nerves in the spine and actually alleviates the symptoms. So people with spinal stenosis will often describe symptoms of, of heaviness in their buttock, pain that's worse sort of starting in their buttock and moving down the back of their legs, but it actually gets better either when they sit down or when they lean over a shopping cart at the grocery store. Now I'm gonna move on to talking more about some soft tissue injuries in the hip itself. And some of the most common ones that we see are labral tears, abductor tendonitis or tearing, and hamstring tendonitis or tearing. So the labrum, as I mentioned, is a cartilage ring that acts as kind of like a cushion, but also a gasket to help hold the ball in the socket. It's this sort of wedge of cartilaginous tissue that goes around the circumference of the ball part here and helps provide some of that stability. And so problems with that can, provide, can cause pain and also a little bit of some micro instability, which is also probably a pain generator. Sports that put a lot of stress on the hip definitely put you at higher risk for developing labral tears. And you can limit some of that risk by strengthening some of the muscles around the hip, specifically the hip abductors, which are the gluteal muscles that come down from the pelvis and attach over here, as well as the hip flexors, which attach over here, and the hamstring muscles as well. The labrum itself can also be damaged with something called femoroacetabular impingement, or FAI. And that is basically a pathology, which I'll show some, some slides on here in a little bit, but where there's some abnormal bony formation about the ball or the socket that then cause the labrum to be pinched in certain positions. And then that pinching can cause labral tearing and then the, the pinching itself can also predispose you to then developing arthritis and, and can actually be pretty painful as well. Snapping in the hip can also be often caused by labral tearing or sometimes some other muscle irritation in the hip joint. Labral tears are most often uh, initially treated with a course of non-surgical management. So anti-inflammatories, things like ibuprofen, Aleve, meloxicam, Celebrex are great. They help bring down some inflammation and allow for some healing of the labral tear. Physical therapy is also really helpful. It helps strengthen some of those muscles around the hip joint that we had talked about, which definitely help preserve some of that hip mobility. Injections can also be helpful. They don't necessarily treat the tear itself, um, but they can help decrease some of the inflammation and, and provide some symptomatic relief. Um, I mentioned here steroid injections, PRP or stem cells. It's, PRP actually stands for plasma-rich protein, but stem cells you may have heard about as well for hip injections. There's some mixed evidence as to how beneficial those can potentially be for both labral tears, but also other pathology in the hip um, and elsewhere in the body. Um, most insurances do not cover the stem cell injections, partly because some of the scientific data, unfortunately, doesn't really support it as much as we would love to have sort of a, a great cure and put stem cells everywhere and, and cure everything. It doesn't necessarily seem to work that well, unfortunately. If the labral tear does not respond well to non-surgical management, then one of the options surgically is hip arthroscopy. So similar to knee arthroscopy, this is where we go into the hip joint with a camera. And then this is actually showing a hip labrum here. This is this curved surface is the ball joint. And then deeper in here is the socket. And you can see here where that labrum is torn and detached from where it's supposed to be on, on the pelvis. So we can repair this with some sutures to, to help address this. And then often the, one of the causes of the labral tearing can be this femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. And so we can also address that arthroscopically. And Dr. Roth, who's one of the surgeons here at the center, does a, quite a bit of hip arthroscopy. And um, if anyone has, has any questions about that, I can try and address them tonight. But also, um, he's a name that you potentially might want to remember if you're interested in some more um, information about hip arthroscopy. Muscles and tendons are also a common source of pain and irritation around the hip joint. And so these are a couple more um, sort of cartoon drawings. The one starting on the left. So this is looking at the back of the pelvis. So it's, it's, imagine someone that's standing facing away from you. And this shows the hamstring, which is actually several muscles that come together and they start up on what you may hear referred to as sort of your sit bone or your ischial tuberosity. It's that bony prominence you can feel deep within your buttock. And that's where all of those muscles start. And then they come down to the knee joint. They come actually past the knee joint. That's one of the reasons why sometimes that irritation can move right down to the knee, knee joint itself. 
but um, they part, some of them go sort of towards the outside part of the knee and some come towards the inside part of the knee. Hamstring tears are, are common. Um, it's, it's often in athletic endeavors and people will describe a pop that they feel in their buttock will often get a lot of bruising. You can also strain or partially tear the hamstring. Um, and again, that presents usually as pain sort of deep within the buttock and sometimes even with some irritation of the sciatic nerve because the sciatic nerve itself sits very close to where these hamstring muscles start there up in the, the, the back part of the pelvis. The hip flexor is um, a muscle called, well, the main hip flexor is the iliopsoas, but it starts on the inner, inner part of the pelvis um, and also the lower part of the lumbar spine, the, the bottom part of your spine. And it comes across the, the front of the hip joint and then it inserts on a little bump here called the lesser trochanter just past the hip. And this is another muscle that can commonly be strained with activities like pickleball and skiing. And this presents as pain sort of deep within the groin in the front of the hip. And sometimes people actually come in thinking that they've strained their hip flexor and really it's a sign of something going on deeper within the hip rather than the muscle itself. The gluteal muscles or the hip abductors, I talked about a little bit briefly, and those are the muscles that help provide some stability with walking and um, single leg stance when you're trying to stand on one leg. And these muscles attach predominantly on the outside part of the hip. So the gluteus minimus, the medius and maximus all insert on sort of different portions of the outside part of the bone. But the most common ones that we see issues with are the gluteus minimus and medius. And they attach on the top portion of the trochanter, which is basically this bump of the hip bone. It's called the greater trochanter. And I'll talk a little bit about trochanteric bursitis or, or irritation, which is another common thing that we see patients for with, with hip pain. So hip or trochanteric bursitis, which is something that you may have heard about, um, basically is some irritation in where the muscles attach on the outside part of the hip. Um, bursa are sort of fluid filled sacs or sacs that generally don't have very much fluid in them, but allow for lubrication between different tissue planes. So around the hip, you have several different planes of tissue and muscle. And these bursa normally allow those, those different muscles to move freely without being irritated, but sometimes because of small tears or irritation in the muscle or in these bursa sacs, then you can get some, some irritation that can actually be quite debilitating. So as I mentioned, it's often related to the greater trochanter, the outside bone, which is that bony prominence. If you reach down and, and touch the outside part of your hip, that bone that you feel on the side of your hip, that's the greater trochanter right there. And oftentimes this type of pain, it, it presents as tenderness um, in those muscles and those bursa right on the side of the hip. It's often worse at night, especially when people try and sleep that side on that side. It's often worse with prolonged walking. And a lot of people describe pain that's worse, especially when they go from sitting to standing or with prolonged standing. This type of pain actually responds very well to physical therapy and anti-inflammatory medication. And so that's the go-to whenever I see patients that come in with bursitis. The physical therapy works to help strengthen these muscles around the hip that are often irritated and potentially even partially torn. And it also helps to mobilize some of these irritated bursal or fluid sacs to help preserve and regain some of that hip mobility. You can sometimes do steroid injections in the hip bursa for trochanteric bursitis, and that can actually provide pretty good symptomatic relief. The problem I've found is that sometimes patients will come in and they'll get an injection and it works so well that then they don't actually go do the therapy and strengthen the muscles. Um, and so then after the injection wears off after several weeks or months, they're right back where they started. So I often will not offer an injection when I first see people for trochanteric bursitis because I really want to drive home the point that it's really the muscle strengthening and mobility that you can do with physical therapy and on your own at home that really will address the pathology and actually solve the underlying problem and, and make you better. Now I'm gonna move on to some sort of structural hip problems or more sort of bony problems um, that in many cases have to be addressed surgically. So this is often due to abnormal shape or development of the ball or of the socket joint itself. So the first one I'm going to touch on again is something called femoracetabular impingement or FAI. And as I mentioned, this is often bony overgrowth that develops around the femoral head or acetabulum. When you get into the technicalities of it a little bit, uh, off of the acetabulum, it's called a pincer lesion. 
and off of the femoral head, it's called a cam lesion. And so you can see in this case with the pincer lesion, how the femoral head or the ball still has a normal shape, but this extra bony prominence off the socket is not going to allow the hip to move freely through range of motion and is going to impinge or butt up against the head of the femur or the, the ball joint in specific positions. You can see sort of the corollary of that is the cam lesion here in this case where the where that ball attaches to the femur, what we call the femoral neck, is no longer sort of nice and smooth with that um, sort of sloping surface there and has this bony prominence. And you can see how when the hip comes up into flexion or out to the side in abduction, that will impinge upon the labrum and the bony part of the pelvis up there. In many cases, you can actually have both cam and pincer deformities um, and one can sort of contribute to the other. And this contributes to break down the labrum and break down to the cartilage um, that then often needs to be addressed because it's sort of an underlying mechanical problem. So this is often treated with hip arthroscopy because in many cases, patients present because of labral tears due to the femoral acetabular impingement. And so this is actually a great picture of an x-ray showing a patient that had come in with this, what we call an aspherical a ball, which is that cam lesion where this is not as nice and rounded here. You can see that sort of extra bump of bone there on the femoral head and, and neck. And then this overlapping bump or the pincer lesion from the socket. And you can see how on the x-ray, they've addressed that nicely by sort of rounding that part of the, the cam lesion away. Basically this bone, they can shave away um, while looking at it with a camera doing the arthroscopic surgery and similarly smoothing off the rim here. And part of the reason that they do that when they do the labor repair is in that that also serves to protect the labrum that they have then repaired so that it's no longer being impinged by the cam and pincer lesions. Hip dysplasia is, is something else that um, we sometimes see. So this is a shallow socket and it's thought to be partly genetic and then also partly developmental. So this x-ray here on the left side shows a normal, what a normal ball and socket look like. And what I want you to take note of is sort of how deep the ball sits within that socket and also how much of that ball is covered by the socket. So you can see that most of this, the ball is actually covered by the socket. Um, Compare that with this x-ray, which is an x-ray showing a, a pretty dysplastic hip. And you can see that only about 50% of that ball joint is covered. And you can also see that it looks like the ball itself is sort of sliding out a little bit from the socket. And that's partly because the slope of the socket is a little bit upsloping. And so all of those are findings that are classic for hip dysplasia. Um, when we talk about hip dysplasia, it's often diagnosed in infants. It's one of the things that we look for as, as doctors when kids are, are newborns and we wanna make sure that the hips are developing normally. The pelvis itself is three bones that, that in an infant and a newborn are joined by a piece of cartilage and that develops normally in part because of the appropriate forces applied by the hip um, ball into the socket as uh, people are walking and growing. And so if the hip has not started to develop properly because of genetics or, or something else, then it will often continue to develop improperly unless that's addressed. So that's why kids will often treat with this bracing if we get to it fast or early enough when, when the hip socket itself is still developing. Um, if we can diagnose it before arthritis has started to develop, and so this is usually sort of in the late teen to mid-20 age group, then one of the options that we can do in terms of hip preservation is a periacetabular osteotomy or a PAO. And what this surgery involves is essentially cutting the, the hip socket away from the pelvis in order to reorient it. So this is actually the, the same patient. Um, and you can see how the hip socket itself um, was reoriented and reaffixed with these screws um, to help hold in place so that more of the femoral head is covered. Um, and then the goal with that is to basically prevent or delay the development of arthritis because this type of hip is going to point load forces across the socket and across the ball. 
that put a lot of extra stress on the cartilage than is normal and causes it to wear out much faster so that you can start to develop arthritis as early as your early 30s. And part of that is also because, again, getting back to one of the, the structures we talked about earlier, the labrum, which is out here, then sort of tries to make up for the fact that there's no bone supporting it, but then often will tear because it's a, it's a cartilage structure. It's not a bony structure. It's not designed to support that amount of weight. Um, so hip dysplasia is something that I often see sort of at the later stages, but um, something we definitely keep an eye out for kids and especially younger people. If, if um, you have had hip dysplasia, it's often heritable, especially uh, it seems to be among women. Um, and so if you or your mother or your daughter are having hip problems, then this could be potentially an underlying source or cause as to what might be causing that. Um, and then things like um, uh, periacetabular osteotomy are ways that we can sort of help preserve that mobility and help keep you doing the things that you love. Really, when it comes to preventing hip injuries, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of you have heard before. So stretching, strengthening, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, physical therapy. Um, I, it, I think a lot of people wish probably that there was sort of a magic bullet that would solve all these things and prevent aging, but really it's, it's keeping your activity level up and doing what, what you can to keep those muscles strong around the hip and, and around the low back. So these are a couple of um, images showing specifically some exercises to work on the hip abductors or the gluteal um, buttock muscles. So one of them is, this is called sideline hip abduction. This is pretty similar to some sort of clamshells or other things that you may have seen or, or done with therapists. And, and there's a lot of things that you can do with, um, with these elastic bands that can help um, also uh, work on strengthening the, the muscles and doing sort of some sidestepping and squatting and, and all sorts of things are, are really great options to work on strengthening those, especially that hip abductors on the side of the hip. The other um, common sort of muscle injury around the hip that we see probably the most of is hamstring injuries. And so sometimes doing these hip bridges and um, also some deadlifts are, are really great options to, to help strengthen some of those muscles. If you haven't done them before or you're, you're getting into something you haven't done in a while, I always recommend um, maybe starting with a therapist so they can help guide you and make sure that you're doing them appropriately because the last thing we want to do is have you start to do some exercises and, and have poor form and then that itself contribute to, to hip injury and decrease your hip mobility. I'm going to move now on to talking a little bit about hip arthritis, um, which I think is why maybe uh, some number of you are here for this talk. So Arthritis is one of the leading causes of disability in, in the United States, and more than 66 million people currently live with arthritis, and as many as 23 million are currently living with arthritis but are not diagnosed as having arthritis as the source of their, their problem. It's also a growing problem. Um, as the population continues to age, millions more each year are going to continue to be impacted by arthritis. By 2030, we expect that there will continue to be as much as a 300% increase in the number of total hip replacements performed every year. And you can just see that this is the number of people who are age 65 and older. That's this blue line is trending over time. And you can see that by, by 2030, um, that's going to represent about 70 million people. So a huge increase in the number of people who are going to potentially need um, hip replacement. So a lot of people ask what actually is arthritis or, or what's going on. And it, at its core, the definition is painful inflammation and stiffness of one or more joints. There are four classic types. Osteoarthritis is the predominant type, and that is basically wear and tear arthritis. Uh, the cartilage wears out over time, and um, there's not much that you can necessarily do to prevent that. I think that, um, again, preserving some of the strength and the muscles around the hip can help preserve appropriate and normal biomechanics around the hip, which can help preserve some of the cartilage in that, in that way. Post-traumatic arthritis is arthritis that develops after some sort of injury. So it doesn't necessarily even have to have caused a fracture, but um, the traumatic injury itself can sometimes damage at a cellular level, the chondrocytes or the cells that help or that make up the cartilage. And that can sometimes manifest sometimes decades after the injury, but can sometimes be the inciting factor as to what caused the arthritis. Another type of arthritis that's fairly common is inflammatory arthritis, and this can be caused by gout, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, or other autoimmune diseases. 
or phenomenon. And this is basically uh, a, an activation of some of the immune cells within the joint that causes a lot of inflammation and in some cases actually destruction of some of the cartilage in the joint. And the last type, which is less common, is something called septic arthritis. And that's what can happen when you get an infection that finds its way into the joint. And what that does is it causes a very profound stimulation of the white blood cells, which actually then causes erosion of the cartilage and of the bony structures of the joint. So classic osteoarthritis is just wear and tear. And often I sort of describe this to patients as the trend on the tire wearing out. So it's something that happens slowly over time. And oftentimes patients will come in and say, well, how did this start? How long has this been going on? Or, you know, what, why is it now causing pain? And you can kind of imagine that as the tread on the tire wears out and it goes bald, the tire sort of becomes weaker and the car may drive fine. But then at some point, the tire blows out because it has gotten too thin and uh, the tire itself is too weak. And that sometimes is what happens with arthritis is that it can percolate for a while and maybe cause a little bit of some stiffness, a little bit of some aching. But it's not until it really starts to manifest itself that it becomes symptomatic. And then unfortunately, once it does, then we sort of are moving towards how can we try and make it less symptomatic. So focusing specifically on hip arthritis, this is just demonstrating with some x-rays and some sort of cartoon diagrams here, what that looks like from a, an x-ray perspective. So this is what a normal joint space looks like. And when patients come into clinic, I always like to try and print out the x-rays and show them the x-rays because I think it's really helpful for them to actually see what their joints and bones look like. And so this shows what the normal space should look like between the ball and the socket. And then this shows what a typical arthritic joint looks like. So that space that you can see over here on the left, that sort of gray area between the ball and the socket is no longer present. You can see that they have developed bone spurs around the femoral head and acetabulum. Um, so the ball and the socket, and they're sort of all over it. So you can see how it no longer is in a nice round ball, and a nice round socket. It's a very irregularly shaped ball in a very irregularly shaped socket. And I think this diagram shows that nicely too, in terms of the cartilage being gone in certain areas and a lot of these bone spurs that develop around the hip. A lot of people ask, what are bone spurs? Bone spurs are basically the body's response physiologically to some of the inflammation that is occurring because the cartilage itself is worn out. So once the cartilage wears out, unfortunately, the body can't really regenerate cartilage. And so therefore, um, it tries to, through a very um, complex uh, inflammatory cascade, try and address the problem. So one of the things that it does is it generates some more fluid around the, the joint. And so sometimes you get swelling in the joint that's arthritic. And then the other thing is it tries to, to stimulate cells to generate cartilage, which unfortunately it can. So often what that does is you end up with these bone spurs or the extra bony production as the body's way of trying to sort of offload some of those areas that are now severely arthritic and without cartilage. So I always like to start with non-surgical treatment for hip arthritis. And the best thing for that is low impact exercise. I have a lot of patients that love to do the elliptical. I think some aquatic therapy or, or pool therapy can also be great. Um, physical therapy is also great, again, just in terms of preserving the mobility, working on strengthening those muscles around the hip. Weight loss can also be quite helpful just because that means there's less force across the hip joint itself and less force across an arthritic joint it just means that you, in many cases, will have less pain. Sometimes um, I recommend that people use assistive devices. I, I think that really when it comes to, or when it comes to treating arthritis, it's all about preserving, preserving your mobility, but also preserving your quality of life. And so when you start to have to limit what you're doing or how you're getting around, then that might sometimes be a sign that we need to think about some other treatment options or potentially even think about surgical options to help preserve that mobility. In terms of medications, anti-inflammatories can be quite helpful. They're not really addressing the underlying problem um, in terms of what is causing the pain, but they do help bring down the inflammation and make the pain a lot more tolerable. And I have several patients who come in with arthritic hips and start them on an anti-inflammatory and it provides great relief and they're able to continue to ski and do all the things that they love. Injections, I think are also a pretty good option. Um, in this case, for the hip joint, we talk about steroid injections. Um, sometimes we can also do some of the lubricating gel type injections uh, in the hip, and those can provide some relief to the symptoms. Again, they're not treating the underlying cause, which is sort of the tread on the tire wearing, wearing out, if you will, but they, again, provide some symptomatic relief to keep you doing the things that you love. 
one of the most common questions I get um, related to hip replacement is when is it time for hip replacement? And what I tell people is it really comes down to quality of life. And when you're experiencing pain that stops you from doing the everyday activity things that you enjoy, then that's time to think about taking the next step in treatment. And for some people, that may be starting physical therapy or starting an anti-inflammatory. But for people who have already tried some of those non-surgical options, in some cases, that means then taking the step towards, towards surgery. And it really, there's no urgency in, uh, in addressing it with a replacement. And it, it comes down to when is the time right for you and for your family and for those that are going to be helping take care of you after surgery. A lot of people ask, well, what can, can or can they not do after, after surgery? And what I tell people is that technically they can probably do whatever they would like. I think a lot of surgeons tell people not to do running or high impact activities after uh, hip replacement. But I think as the implants have gotten better, I think that the longevity of the implants is something that we're probably a little bit less concerned about over time. Um, and so I think that I tell people the reason that we're doing it is to sort of preserve your activity, preserve your mobility, and, and let you do the things that you enjoy. And especially with all the plethora of options that we have here in Central Oregon, um, I really enjoy getting people back to all those activities that they love. Hip replacement in terms of surgery, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, is, is still fairly young. Um, it's often described as the operation of the century because modern hip replacement really didn't sort of come into, into play until the late 19 or early 1960s. Before that, we were experimenting with things like ivory, glass, all metal hip replacements. But the first low friction hip replacement, which is shown over here on the right, was done by Sir John Charmley um, in the United Kingdom. And he was sort of the pioneer of, of arthroplasty. And that really sort of set the tone for, for things going forward. And things have come a long way um, since the 1960s. Um, and I think Initially, it's a surgery that was reserved for older patients who weren't as active, and that partly had to do with some of the technologies that were used both to do the surgery and related to the implants themselves. But they've come a long way so that now the implants shown uh, as an example here on the left are much more durable um, and in many cases showing good durability past probably at least 20 years. There have been several advances um, in the last probably 10 or 15 years that really have allowed the hip replacement to expand in terms of who is a candidate and who can benefit from it and who we're willing to perform it on as surgeons. And I think one of the biggest benefits is probably highly cross-linked polyethylene or the type of plastic that we use for hip replacement. The older types of plastic, such as those that were initially used in the 1960s, were not cross-linked, meaning that they didn't have as many links between the actual plastic fibers at a microscopic level. By processing them differently so that they're highly cross-linked, it modified the wear characteristics so that instead of wearing out at about one millimeter per year, they wear out now at a fraction of a millimeter per year. And so that allows us to rely more on these implants and perform the surgeries in patients who are younger and more active and lessen the amount of restrictions in terms of activity after the replacement. Another hugely beneficial um, thing that we use now in joint replacement is something called transexamic acid, or TXA. This is a medication that at a cellular level helps to stabilize blood clots that have formed. It doesn't cause your body to form blood clots, but in, a, in an area where you have had surgery, it helps stabilize them and help decrease the amount of bleeding so that joint replacement, particularly hip replacement, used to commonly have high volumes of blood loss and require blood transfusion afterwards. And now that's a rarity. And so that has really allowed for advances in joint replacement and also allowed for the shift towards surgery being able to be done as an outpatient, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Multimodal pain pathways have also been instrumental in allowing us to sort of optimize patient outcomes related to surgery. We as a profession and society have swung a, a long way from the sort of uh, common use of narcotic pain medication in high quantities and are much more cautious with how we use that, how we use both anti-inflammatories and sometimes some nerve type medication, muscle relaxants, and try and minimize the amount of narcotics that are, are necessary after surgery. And I think combining that with things like transexamic acid and more minimally invasive surgery allow for patients to do much better after surgery with less narcotic pain requirements. <laughs> 
So this is a diagram of sort of what a hip replacement looks like. There are basically four main parts. One is the acetabular component or the socket, which is often made out of titanium. That has a roughened surface that is pressed into the bone and then the bone actually grows into that sort of sandpaper-like surface on the socket side. Inside of that socket, you get that plastic liner, which is now with that highly cross-linked polyethylene. And then down into the femur, is pressed at the femoral component and that goes inside sort of the hollow part of the femur and also has a roughened surface that your bone grows into. And then on top of that is a femoral head. And so this modular hip replacement also allows us to, compared to some of the earlier hip replacements, really do more of a patient specific type of surgery and really match the patient's anatomy. Um, and then that helps also improve outcomes and preserve mobility. So hip replacement has changed a lot, as I mentioned. Um, it's moved from a predominantly inpatient, meaning done in the hospital stay, to predominantly outpatient. Surgeries that used to be long and invasive are now moving towards being much less invasive. Blood transfusions are no longer common. Oftentimes we would bring patients into the hospital a few days before surgery, put them in bed rest, leave them in the hospital for sometimes as long as a week or several weeks after surgery. And now with rapid recovery, early mobilization protocols of physical therapy and multimodal pain pathways, we're getting people up and moving within a few hours of therapy, doing stairs and getting people home the same day of surgery. Another big shift was the shift from predominantly using general anesthesia with uh, intubation or a tube down your throat to now doing mostly spinal anesthetic and nerve blocks. We also rarely now use urinary catheters. We rarely use surgical drains. And again, just targeting back to that multimodal pain pathway, I think is really important to help make sure that patients progress through surgery in a way that's, that's safe. So it feels like 2020 in some ways has lingered into 2021 and 2022 in terms of how it has affected orthopedics and healthcare. Um, we're seeing again, a, a huge surge in um, COVID and RSV and flu, and that's continued to have an impact on sort of how our day-to-day -day surgical schedule looks. But this was a study that was done sort of late in, in um, 2020, earlier in the COVID pandemic. And at that point, they were projecting a national backlog of more than 1 million orthopedic surgeries that were going to take potentially two years to work through. Um, if any of my patients are on here, I, I know that sometimes it seems like we're really struggling to, to get things done, even after we've seen you and decided that we're going to proceed with the hip replacement. And I think we're all just trying to work through this backlog. There was a, unfortunately a long period of time where people weren't able to get surgery. And as we're trying to work our way back through that, as COVID has also continued to um, be a problem uh, and cause issues over the, the last several years, then we're continuing to see that backlog. And unfortunately, I don't know that we necessarily have, it feels like sometimes we haven't made a huge dent in it, but we're trying to get people cared for as, as quickly as we can. So there are several benefits, I think, to outpatient surgery, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about now. So this is a program that first began at the surgery center here at the center um, in 2016. Initially, it was sort of a small program, not many joint replacements were done each year there. And that has grown pretty rapidly over the last two years, I think partly because of, of COVID and some of the pressures on our hospital here in Bend to a point where now this year, we're probably gonna do, we may do close to a thousand joint replacements, that's hip, knee and shoulder. Um, at our surgery center in 2022. And this was initially driven by a, a desire by the surgeons here to really optimize care for patients. We want to keep patients out of the hospital. Um, we want to emphasize rapid recovery, multimodal pain control. And we also want to save costs because when we can do the surgery here as opposed to at the hospital, it's a massive savings um, in terms of cost for the healthcare system. This was underpinned at its core by an emphasis on patient safety. So that's part of the reason why it started slow and took some time to grow was because we wanted to make sure that we were doing it safely. There have been many studies looking at the benefits of and, and safety of outpatient joint replacement. This was one done several years ago um, by Dr. Berger and, at Rush University of Chicago and showed that outpatient joint replacement did not increase the rate of complications after, after surgery. And then this was another one um, also done at Rush by Dr. De La Valle, and this showed that patients that underwent outpatient total joint replacement surgery actually had higher rates of satisfaction after surgery. And so this has made its way into the lay press. This is an article from the New York Times from several years ago saying that there actually may be no place like home potentially to recover after your knee or hip replacement. 
So that's where it covers what I wanted to, to get through. I, I know we started at the top with some anatomy and some different things in terms of what can be the cause and source of different hip pain. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what you can do as a patient to try to preserve some of that mobility and keep you doing the things that you love. And then I transitioned to talking a little bit about hip replacement there at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. Looks like there's a couple questions here that um, I'll, uh, I'll address here. Um, and so one of the questions um, is relating to um, steroid injections and whether they actually weaken the hip joint. So um, there's, there's some, particularly in the hip, there's some emerging evidence that shows that there is a, a small risk, probably about 1% or so, of something called rapidly progressive chondrolysis. And so sometimes the steroid medicine, when it's injected into the hip joint, can cause this phenomenon where the cartilage actually wears out much faster. That's not something that we commonly see. That's not something that we see in other joints, in the shoulder or in the knee or other joints where we do steroids, but it is something that we definitely can sometimes see in the hip joint. And I've had several patients where their arthritis maybe isn't so bad and they get a hip injection and then things rapidly deteriorate. It could also be that things were sort of on the cusp and the, the steroid maybe sort of kicked things over the edge a little bit. Um, but uh, the steroid injections don't necessarily weaken the joint, but, but sometimes they can cause that phenomenon of that rapidly progressive loss of the cartilage. Um, I have another question here specifically about um, addressing anterior versus posterior hip replacement. Um, so, uh, this is um, a sort of growing area of research and, and something that sort of you'll have a lot of surgeons debate about. So I myself do mostly anterior approach. Um, what I'll tell patients is that that's partly related to how I was trained. I think that even though the surgery is technically a little bit more demanding, I think that it allows for a what has been shown in the, in the literature, a little bit more of a faster recovery, especially in those first probably four to six weeks after surgery. If you look at the ultimate recovery from hip replacement, whether it's anterior or posterior, the outcomes in about a year are equivalent. Um, but I think for a lot of people, that faster recovery, especially people who are really active here in Central Oregon, makes a difference. Um, and I think the other thing that I think provides a benefit for anterior versus posterior approach um, is that at least the way that I do it, I take x-rays during the surgery. It allows for us to be a little bit more precise with our component positioning. Um, and then the fact that we keep the muscles generally intact in the back of the hip provides a little bit of an increase in terms of hip stability and decrease in terms of the risk of dislocation. That said, I think that if, if you have a surgeon or have seen a surgeon who does a uh, posterior approach and that's what they've been trained in, I think that it, you have great outcomes from that as well. I think that a lot of the shift is partly driven a little bit sort of by the catchiness of anterior approach. Um, and I think also driven by training as more trainees are exposed to it as they come out of training, then that is starting to shift what surgeons do when they come out into practice. At our most recent national joint replacement um, meeting back uh, early in November, they frequently poll the, the membership as to various different things. And one of the questions that they constantly ask is what is the approach that most surgeon or what is the prominent approach that you use as a surgeon for hip replacement? And this was one of the first years that anterior actually surpassed posterior in terms of what is being done by most surgeons. And I think that's driven largely, like I said, by training. Um, and some of it is also driven by what patients are seeking. And so I think some of you may have had patients or friends who have had it anterior or posterior and sort of swear by it. And I believe in it and it's something that I do. But I also think, like I said, um, a good hip surgeon is a good hip surgeon. No matter how they get to the hip, I think you'll get a great outcome. Uh, are there specific recommendations for folks diagnosed with both hip osteoarthritis and osteoporosis? So osteoarthritis, as we talked about, is the degeneration of the cartilage um, in the hip socket. And osteoporosis is the thinning uh, or weakening of the bone, um, which happens as, as a part of aging. Um, one of the best things that you can do for osteoporosis and bone health is calcium and vitamin D. Another thing that's great for bone health is weight-bearing activity. So whether that's hiking, um, walking, um, pickleball, all those things are, are great for just stimulating the bone to stay healthy. Um, for people who have both, I think that they should sort of be treated independently, but also the one should not be forgotten about when, when addressing the other. So um, 
for people who have osteoporosis, I will often then instead of using a hip replacement that relies on the bone to grow into the, the hip replacement, I'll use a cemented hip replacement, especially in the femur. And the reason for that is that there's been some emerging literature when you look at the joint, National Joint Replacement Registry that shows that patients over the age of 75, when you use what's called a press fit or a cementless hip replacement, have a little bit of a higher risk of fracture. And that probably is due to the underlying bone weakness, especially in patients who have osteoporosis. And using a cemented hip replacement, which is something that sort of fell out of favor again, because it's something that trainees weren't as exposed to in the US in particular, is something that's gaining popularity again. Um, and I think if you look at some of the data out of the United Kingdom, where they still continue to do a lot of cemented hip replacement, if there is great longevity um, across all age groups. Um, and so I think as a way of decreasing the risk of fracture around the time of surgery and people who have osteoporosis, if they're getting a hip replacement, that's what I'll often do. Um, oftentimes you can also treat osteoporosis depending on how severe it is with medications. And so I often refer people to either their primary care doctor or their endocrinologist. If they have more severe osteoporosis, then sometimes we treat it with medications called bisphosphonates, which help to strengthen the bone and decrease the risk of fracture, which is one of the things that we worry about most with osteoporosis. Uh, let's see. Um, there what is a question about um, a step prior to hip replacement as sort of a preventative surgical procedure. I think that may have been referring to either hip arthroscopy or a periostabular osteotomy. Um, so both of those are sort of addressing um, different types of hip pathology that are not necessarily arthritis, and but can lead to arthritis if they're left untreated. So hip arthroscopy is often used for patients who have tears of labrum and who have uh, hip impingement or femoral acetabular impingement, and they can do some shaving of some of the bone spurs or extra bone around the hip. Once the cartilage in the, in the hip socket starts to wear out, in some ways the cat's out of the bag a little bit. And if you look at some of the literature in terms of what happens if people have a hip arthroscopy or a hip scope when they have already started to have degeneration of the cartilage surface, Many of them end up in short order just proceeding to a hip replacement. And so once there's evidence of wear and tear of the cartilage of the socket, then some of those other procedures, um, such as the hip arthroscopy or the acetabular osteotomy in the case of hip dysplasia, no longer really provide much benefit. Here's a question about um, treatment options for glute, hamstring, iliopsoas, chronic tendinopathy. So that is um, basically asking about um, treatment options for chronic tendinopathy about all of the muscles around the hip. Um, and so I think that one of the one of the things that would be a mainstay for this would be um, physical therapy or a home exercise program. It works on strengthening these muscles. Depending on the muscle group, some respond better to eccentric or concentric types of loading, which is sort of has to do with whether the muscle is lengthening or shortening at the time that it's being exercised. And that's why I think if, if you've got irritation about all these muscles, then it, it may be a great idea to, to get in to see one of us or potentially get in to see a therapist so that they can provide some more directed therapy um, and provide you with a, a more specific treatment regimen. Sometimes also I've found that patients have irritation of sort of all of the muscles around the hip. And really it's a sign that there's something going on deeper in the hip. In some cases we'll come in and we'll get an x-ray and they'll have quite severe arthritis or they'll have something else going on that's really causing all those muscles and tissues around the hip to be irritated. Uh, this is a question about deterioration of a right knee causing sciatic pain um, in the butt and hip. Um, so oftentimes, as I sort of said at the outset, hip and, and knee and leg pain can sort of overlap. Um, I will sometimes see patients who come in for a knee pain assessment. And after we examine them and get some x-rays, it's actually the hip that's causing the pain. And it's causing radiation of that pain down towards the knee because of some of the nerves that can be irritated up in the hip. Um, it's oftentimes also when one particular joint in the lower extremity, the, the hip, the knee, the ankle is irritated, it can cause alteration in your gait mechanics in terms of how you walk and, and get through your day. And that can then cause irritation elsewhere in the flow back on the other side. Um, and so it is common to have one 
sort of irritated joints sometimes cause irritation in other joints. And potentially it's also a sign that there are multiple things going on. Sometimes there can be problems both in the knee and or the back uh, in that case. Uh, here's a question sp pretty specific about fish oil supplements before hip replacement, how long after and when to resume after surgery. So fish oil is great as a natural anti-inflammatory. Um, I know we, we prescribe a lot of um, like sort of chemical anti-inflammatories, but fish oil omega-3s are great in terms of decreasing inflammation and overall health. Um, they can also, similar to anti-inflammatories, increase the bleeding risk a little bit at the time of surgery. And so I recommend, most surgeons recommend stopping those type of supplements about a week before surgery. And then they can start again a few days usually after surgery. Uh, here's a question specifically about running after hip replacement. Um, I think even my own sort of perspective on this is in evolution a little bit. I have one particular patient um, who I'm thinking of who um, he came in to see me. He had a terribly arthritic hip. The other one had already been replaced and he knew he needed a hip replacement. Um, and he also told me that uh, I don't care what you tell me, I'm going to run after you replace it because this is what's important to me. I think that I just have a frank conversation with patients uh, about this. I think that the implants have come a long way. I think that long longevity of the implants still remains probably my primary concern as a surgeon in terms of when you're putting more force across the artificial joint, how is that going to hold up over time? I think that if you look at some biomechanic studies, there may be some activities that we actually have no qualms about letting people do, such as skiing, that may actually have higher forces across the joint. Um, and I think it really comes down to quality of life. And it's sort of a shared decision between the patient and the surgeon as to what's important to them and, and what they want to do. And also realizing that running may potentially wear things out a little bit faster. And so that potentially that plastic liner might need to be replaced sooner than it would have been otherwise. But if running is really what is important to you, um, even though I probably generally recommend against it, I also think that it's not something that, it, that you can't do afterwards. And that's another thing that was actually, um, was one of the questions that was asked at the, the recent national meeting that I went to. And there's also an increasing shift towards surgeons saying that they have absolutely no restrictions after surgery. There are less and less surgeons um, that are part of this national organization that are saying that you can't run after a replacement. I think it's partly because they become more and more comfortable with the plastic, particularly that's been around now for about 20, 25 years, and how that will hold up over time. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you have recommendations for anti-inflammatories and how much is too much for your liver? <laughs> um, so um, this is a question specifically about anti-inflammatory dosing. I think everybody's a little bit different. Um, each of the anti-inflammatories is a little bit different. Um, I have specific protocols that I usually use um, when patients come in to see me. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to reach out specifically to um, either your primary care doctor or anyone that you're seeing about um, what would be appropriate for you. If you do have underlying liver problems, then that can change which, uh, which medications you should be on and, and how much you should be on of those different medications. Um, and then also that can, uh, the thing that can affect some of those anti-inflammatories is what your, your kidney function is like. Uh, my, there's, here's a question about, um, sounds like a old hip fracture and um, what medications I would recommend. Um, the the anti-inflammatory my go-to is often a, a medication called meloxicam or Mobic. It's formulated to be a little bit easier on the stomach um, and maybe have a little bit of a lower risk of some of the ulceration. Um, the advantage of that too is it's similar to a leave and that it can be taken once or twice daily. And so you don't have to take it quite as consistently as you do say ibuprofen. Um, and so get some longer term relief, which I can be, think can be quite helpful for people. Um, here is a question about radiation for breast cancer and whether it can affect other parts of the body and also potentially related to a, a chemo pill. Um, so um, the short answer I would say is Yes, potentially. Um, I think that a lot of these medications act in a lot of different complex ways throughout the body in terms of how they can alter metabolism of uh, both bony cells and other cells throughout the body. Um, and so it could potentially be that some of those um, medications are, are interacting with that, but without knowing specifically which medications they are, it's hard to, to answer that a little bit more specifically. Um, it could be that some of these medications are in some way interacting with or affecting the inflammation in the body and that may be causing irritation of a joint that is maybe um, already irritated. 
Um, there's also a pretty specific question about um, a uh, failed hip replacement. I would say that um, my uh, training was um, in hip and knee replacement and also sort of redo hip and knee replacement and things that go bad in terms of hip and knee replacement. Um, I think that's something that I'm really passionate about um, because I want to take care of people not only when they need their hip replacement or knee replacement, but also along the whole spectrum. Um, if anything uh, goes wrong or they've had one that has been done elsewhere and, and it needs to be improved. Um, and I had quite extensive training at the University of Utah about how to take care of those types of patients. Um, and I'd be more than happy to uh, to see anyone that is on here that, that has problems with that. Um, with that, we're coming up right a little past seven o'clock. Um, and so I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up here. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, hopefully this was beneficial for you and um, you got something out of it. And uh, hopefully um, I will see you around on the slopes or on the hiking trails here in Bend. Have a great evening.